So I uh, hope everyone's rested, a little more energy from, uh, from uh, meditation. The, I'm following, this presentation is uh, really something we put together for uh, our Navy IG folks uh, a, a few weeks ago, so it's a, a bit of an iteration from that. But it's really taking feedback to uh, the next level and getting, I think, more detailed about the lessons that we've learned about implementing feedback in an organization and how, how important it is. So I'm going to start off with this diagram here, which is, for me, represents kind of the most visceral sort of uh, description of when we talk about lying, hiding, and faking in cultures where people don't actually just tell each other what's actually on their mind, like what does that feel like? And to me, it's this, this metaphor of the eggshell. So I work here, I'm on this floor all the time, every day, you know, six days a week, basically, I'm here in one way, shape, or form. And whenever I feel that there's some tension between me and some other person, or there's some groups not working, I, I can literally kind of feel like the eggshells. So you know, if there's an office down there, I know this, oh God, I want to tell this person something, but they're going to be, it's going to be a pain for me to tell them this. Like literally, I can feel myself sort of walking around the eggshells, trying not to, you know, trying not to crush those things and, and being, pulling myself back. And I think that's in pretty much every organization, in pretty much every office, there's that kind of feeling where either between yourself, between others, there's just something unsaid, there's a friction there, you aren't just freely saying whatever whatever's on your mind. And that's what it feels like, that you can't say what you really feel, like people are not telling you things, maybe they have some criticism, but they're not actually saying it. It's not, it's not safe to disagree, so maybe my, you know, my manager is doing something I don't like, but there's really no way for me to tell them that. Uh, it's not safe to be honest. I'll get in trouble if I say what I'm really thinking. So it feels like walking on eggshells. And poor, poor performing teams are surrounded by eggshells. Teams that are so insular and so not communicative and so kind of not open with each other, those teams are just, pot there's a pile of eggshells all around them. And the problem with that, of course, is that poor performing teams destroy value. I think when we're at a Whitby Island with uh, some of our Navy people, the, um, the way they described it is, you know, it's worse for them. It's worse for you guys because when people, when there, are te when there are teams with eggshells, people can die. So how do you get around that? So that's kind of what I want is the opposite, which is, I think Megan probably showed that picture earlier today of, you know, a SWAT team or a whatever team that is. But when you're in that mode, when you're all in, like everyone's fully engaged, giving everything they got, their full energy and telling each other exactly what they're feeling, thinking, like, most work, kind of day-to-day -day work environments are the opposite of that. People are not kind of fully engaged and they're not freely sharing their thoughts and their, their intuition and their feelings. So that's the theory. And I'm, a, I'm an engineer by training and trade, so for 30 years now. Um, and when I see, when I hear something like that, I guess my natural inclination is I want to figure out, so that's kind of a fuzzy theory, but how do you actually translate that into something? And so the inspiration that we had was this. <coughs> can we actually predict numerically and with data good leadership? Like, can we learn stuff about leadership? So this thing here is my actual credit report. And that was the, the inspiration that we started with uh, maybe a year, 18 months ago. So also the competitive environment when I showed this, the emails that I got back almost instantly uh, when I showed it to the company was everyone telling me how, how, they, how they had a better credit score than I did. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so, you know, Experian, really Equifax, TransUnion, kind of like where my, my credit is. This is, I'm paranoid, so I signed up for this service that shows me every month or every quarter, like uh, someone opening a credit card for you or whatever. The interesting thing about the credit analogy is this. It's not when a bank is deciding whether to lend you money for a house, they're not really looking at sort of positive factors. They're trying to figure out, are you not doing the things that make you a bad risk? Are you not overextending? Are you not opening up too many credit cards? Are you, you know, not, not paying? And in the same way, we're looking at, so we now have all this data on both the behavior of employees, the behavior of clients, and as well as performance. Is there data that would show up that says this person is actually doing the things that make them a bad leader? And that's the, the thesis that we went under and uh, what, what I'll share now. The number one thing that we found is this that a leader should not be lying, hiding, and thinking. A leader should be someone that tells the truth and shares the truth and is very communicative. So how did we kind of um, kind of explore this? So we, we ha have the feedback app. You've all seen that. I hope you've all used it at least once. But you're seeing it. So we've been running this for you know, two years or more, and then we had even prior versions of it that we have data from. 
And every time you leave feedback, you're leaving this data trail. So this is, I guess, Greg Kunkel up here, my colleague, uh, talking partner in Boston. This is his graph. So at the bottom here is kind of over time, and then you're seeing every dot represents some piece of some piece of feedback. And then we have that for everyone in our company. We have that for any partner that we've been dealing with. We have a whole, whole lot of data on that. Just more data. We, we cut this every which way from Sunday, looking at what about feedback correlates to performance. Is it that you get you know, really good ratings? Is it that you, you know, some person in particular, if they give you feedback, that matters? Like what, what matters about the data? And what we found, I'll kind of go into the, probably the number one insight last year, but um, this framework of analyzing the data we found the most powerful. It's probably two kind of non-intuitive parts of it. So we grouped everyone in our company into one of these four buckets. Number one, your feedback is trending up. Meaning, so relative to the recent past, you're getting more positive feedback. So that's awesome, you're doing better. Whatever it is you're doing, you should do more of that, you're doing better. The other thing that we found is that your recent feedback is doing worse. And what we call this is investment in loss because what we found is that people that get bad feedback are also the people that often get good feedback eventually. In that they're getting bad feedback because they're actually putting themselves out there and trying something new. And the reality is if you try something new, you're gonna be worse first. And these are the people that have really the balls to go out there and try new stuff. And they, they get dinged for it. And so you see they're, they're both green because we found this behavior that the people that are putting themselves out there, it do almost doesn't matter if they're getting bad feedback in kind of lower scores or higher scores, it's the fact that you're on the field playing that ultimately predicts in the long run you're gonna do better. What's bad is the other side of the equation where either you're it's called flat, so that just means for a long period of time just kind of getting the same type of feedback. That just means you're, not, you're, you're in your comfort zone. So unless you're performing at the most elite level humanly possible, that's not good because that means you're, you're, you're not trying, you're not kind of pushing yourself out there. However, the absolute worst thing is this thing at the end, which unfortunately is where most people end up. It's what we call hiding. You're not really getting any feedback. So you're not even on the field, you're not even playing the game. What we found is that the worst performing teams have leaders in these buckets. The worst performing teams, the teams that are dragging down the rest of the company, their leaders are hiding. Their leaders are not, not only are they just it would be great if they were trying stuff and failing. They're not putting themselves out there. and They're literally not, they're trying to protect themselves. They're not, uh, they're not growing, so their teams are not growing. And so the leaders of these teams, we found their teams were people that quit. Their teams were the ones that were getting lower performance reviews. They were the teams where people feel like their manager wasn't grooming them. Uh, all these kind of bad things come out of this idea that you're not if your leader isn't growing, if your leader isn't taking chances, if your leader isn't putting themselves out there, that has a big influence on the whole team. The, um, let's see. This whole topic of feedback is actually a giant, sort of a tidal wave of interest now, coming from all, all sectors, both the corporate sectors as well as um, kind of the military, nonprofit, everywhere. Uh, this quote here is from Josh Burshin. I think we have some, some people here from E&Y, so it's kind of a competitive, uh, uh, competitive person, but uh, person at Deloitte, he's uh, a very well-known kind of thinker in the, in the HR space, and I love this quote bit. At an organizational level, it is scary to let employees give us their opinion whenever they want. Of course it is, that, but that horse has already left the barn. People now post information about their workplace on a variety of online sites, Glassdoor, Facebook, etc., or share it with their friends. So I think a lot of resistance that organizations have about creating feedback mechanisms is that, well, I don't, you know, it's scary to like let people actually say what they're actually thinking. Uh, but the reality is people are already doing it. So how do you capture that and do it in a way that's healthy for the organization? Uh, the other, um, from Admiral uh, Shalansky, the uh, IG of the, of the Navy, nobody wants to admit defeat, failure, or any setbacks. Underperformers don't get or deny any real feedback. I think that's, in a nutshell, what we found in the data. Like in the business world, our CNO sees this as a needed competitive edge against our adversaries at stake is nothing less than national security. So. You guys are working on national security. You guys are working on things that are so, so important. But the interesting thing is, I think what we're seeing from all sectors is a very kind of similar theme that in order to get people to grow they, and get them the feedback that will allow them to accurately self-assess, self -assess, it's like a scary thing and lots of companies are doing, lots of organizations are doing different things to try to crack that problem. What I'm gonna share with you is the very, I guess, the specific things we've learned 
that have allowed us to, to crack it here. And really, we, we've been focused on three problems uh, so far. One is the fear of giving candid feedback. Is it, it's scary to tell someone the truth, so how do we overcome that? The third is the fear of looking bad in front of peers. So if you get candid feedback and that feedback is not good about you, how do you deal with that? So that's, I'll share some of my feedback, which was not so great, and it's not good. So how, how do you deal with that? And then number three, probably most importantly, how do you develop a culture and a system where people own their own feedback? They're taking control of it, they feel in control of it, they have agency over it, that makes them want to seek more. So to start with the first, problem number one. Problem number one, the fear of giving candid feedback. That's me, this is the, uh, the top of my PowerPoint skills ever. Uh, <laughs> head there. Uh, why do you not tell someone the truth? For lots of normal, social reasons, unless you're a psychopath, you have these thoughts, like I don't want to hurt their feelings, am I being judgmental, am I a hypocrite, will I get in trouble? So there's lots of normal psychological reasons, you know, we're all normal people, that you wouldn't want to necessarily tell someone the God's honest truth that is in your head. <coughs> and part of, I think, our role as leaders is to set up the kind of the, the explanation for our teams as to why we're doing this. And we're going to inject more truth. We're going to tell each other the truth more. And why are we going to do that? It's, a, I think, a very interesting, um, kind of well-done kind of site and, and uh, set of thinking from Radical Candor. So I forget the woman's name that uh, invented it. She has a nice TED talk. But she describes it this way, that in terms of giving feedback, there's on these two axes, there's challenge directly, which is you want to tell people the dead-on truth. And on the y-axis, it's care personally. So if, you, if someone really thinks that you care about them, and you tell them the hard truth, that's what radical candor is. And that's good. That's, that's the spot you want to get to. Most people default to either you know, two or three. Most commonly, three, which is what I call who is empathy. It's like you do some kind of disastrous job, and your, best, and your buddy says, oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. We do that to each other all the time especially in less stressful situations, that adds up over years where it's very common for someone to go through a career where they're not actually getting honest, direct, sometimes harsh feedback for a long time because people are just kind of, they're giving them the blow-off answer. And for most organizations, the blow-off answer is the default answer. It would be better, actually, to be in the obnoxious aggression zone, which is you're giving it too rough. You're telling someone the truth. It's not coming off right. They don't really feel like you care about them. That, ha that has consequences, and to be honest, I think Next Job has gone through phases. We're still battling with this. Like, how, how do you not come across as obnoxiously aggressive? Like, tell me someone that does feel kind of unfair or hurtful. How do you balance that with um, them feeling that they care about? So I think from an intention point of view, the intention is, you know, with my team, I want to be in the radical candor zone with them. Uh, kind of related thought from from Jim Lear, who we work with a lot, is that cultures where everyone is nice are filled with inauthentic kindness. I think that's the same thing as ruinous empathy. That the idea that when you deal with organizations where everyone is like nice to each other, that doesn't align with high performance and it doesn't because it doesn't align with people getting self awareness of themselves. It doesn't align with people valuing the hard thing, which is telling someone something difficult for their own kind of long term benefit, as opposed to the easy thing is it's just hard for me to tell you the, the hard truth. So a few, um, I guess, very specific kind of features of our feedback system that we think help overcome this. Number one, it's visceral fast versus thoughtful slow. When you give people the opportunity to write feedback, I think often the default is like um, you give them a lot of time to do it. We found that is a mistake. If I said after this presentation, I you guys think overnight, you know, give me some feedback on you know how how I, how I did right now. I doubt any of you would write, maybe two of you would write something. As opposed to what, what works is at the end of pretty much every meeting at Next Jump or every kind of sizable significant meeting, we'll say, okay, everyone, uh, five minutes now, just send me your visceral thoughts. So number one, if you don't do it right away, people tend not to do it at all. Um, but the other kind of more insidious thing is when you give people time, they, they tend to soften it because they're looking for the perfect words. When you say that, you know, we're actually making this time limited, I just want to know your visceral thoughts. I don't overthink it you actually get more accurate kind of truth out of people because you're not, you don't have to decode the kind of political language that they come up with. 
we all do it. If you give me enough time, I'll come up with a permit order for you, which, may, depending on how you read it, you know, might be true, might be not true. So fast and visceral is better than thoughtful and slow. Uh, the other thing that we found is, in our rating scale, what we call normalized to a two. The feedback that I want, especially from the team that I work with the most, I want it to be relative to me, meaning two is what I normally do. If I just give the same thing I normally do, just give me a two. Don't give me a four because you know, you're trying to make me feel any better. And the problem is, especially when you introduce feedback into an organization for the first time or more formalized, you know, kind of pulse real-time feedback, people tend to just want to give each other platitudes. Like, you'll see a lot of fours. So this is this has happened literally every, every, every single time we've launched the feedback app with a partner. We've seen this, where um, almost every rating is a three or a four. People are just kind of giving each other nice stuff. Versus what happens with next jump is the normal rating is a two. And then it kind of, you know, it's more of a bell curve. That's what it should actually, that's what it should actually the other thing, this was uh, the thing in the background is the actual feedback that one of our partners launched uh, the, the first few days after they were launching. Just a few little small up there. But it's all just kind of general platitude. It's not, it's not particularly useful feedback because all they're trying to do is make each other feel, feel good. It's not, actual, not actually critical feedback. And it's not that you want to discourage people. If someone did a good job, you should absolutely tell them that they did a good job. But it's a worse, it's a disservice if you're giving someone an incorrect signal. The right signal to me is that whatever I normally do is a two. If I surprise you, three, four. If I disappoint you, you just give me a one. So actually creating that uh, norm, uh, normalizing to a two is important. Uh, I, I relate directly to kind of the, the Uber or Netflix uh, phenomenon. So I think this every time I take an Uber ride, uh, you know, at the end you kind of kind of give someone a five star rating and. All of these systems, whether it's Netflix, actually Netflix just got rid of it because of this phenomenon But Uber too, people tend to get ones or fives. It's like a barbell. Because people, they're thinking all sorts of things. Like if I give someone, if I give this driver a one, are other drivers going to be able to see that and then they'll never, I'll never get picked up again. People have all these like weird convoluted things. And just the, all these internet businesses, Netflix, uh, Amazon, others have simply found that actually what, what works better is thumbs up, thumbs down. It's kind of a binary, a binary response. Because uh, that, that's how people think. So if you give someone a, um, let's get all goes down to, if you give them a, if you leave people alone, they're gonna give everyone a four. Unless you do really badly, give you a one. But you won't get useful information if you do that. <coughs> the uh, next learning was, I think something we talked about earlier, someone asked a question, at least here in New York, how come we give people a numerical rating as well as a qualitative kind of copy or um, you know, a written feedback? So in the app itself, there's, the pages or the screen is divided into a numerical rating, one, two, three, four. That wasn't clear. One is needs improvement, two is what I expect, three, awesome, four, you blew my mind. So you give the numerical rating and then you actually write something. Especially when launching feedback into an organization, people are so in practice at telling each other the truth. They're so afraid to do it. They tend to write things in words that are very <coughs> ambiguous. So you might see things like, I could peel this out of an actual feedback. I really like the summary, the summary of results, a good innovation. But overall, the preso was hard to follow, and I think you lost a lot of people. So was that a one or a three? Who knows? But once again, by forcing the number, you're actually giving people an actual signal that makes sense that they can react to, as opposed to relying on people's sort of writing abilities and sort of, uh, which are bad to start. The other thing you get a lot is this kind of, you know, one word answer, two word answer, you know, great job. Once again, it's not, that's not useful feedback. The second problem set that we've been uh, working on is fear of looking bad in front of peers. And this is a big one, because to get feedback, it's almost easy to give other people feedback. Or, but if you are going to get it, then it's like, oh my god, that's a little scary. Uh, this is a whole separate topic, and we could speak for two, two hours on this. But especially as leaders, and kind of what's most important to me is this idea of encouraging people to be the real you versus the fake you and making it safe to do that. This is kind of a, a Twitter exchange from, from a, a little while ago. But the dynamic that occurs is this, that if you set up a, an environment where people are giving feedback to each other, especially sporadically, like maybe once a year, what you will do naturally is try to do awesome for that one event. You will do the best, the best you will come out of that. Like, there's no other way to get around that. You'll try to, everyone wants to do well, everyone wants to present their best self. 
However, if you aren't actually getting feedback on the authentic you, on how you actually think, then you're just getting better at getting feedback on being a presenter, on being a TV kind of face, on being a fraud, whatever you want to call it. And so I think one of the beauties of more frequent feedback is that it makes it harder for you to fake things. It makes it harder for you to you know, put on a show because you're, you're getting feedback you know, more often. But it is much more valuable when people make this mental leap that I would rather expose something that is flawed because often I'll, I'll present some idea and I think, you know, 60% I think this is a good idea, but 40% this could be stupid, right? And I, unless you get into the mindset of, I'm gonna present this idea even though I might get dinged because I've taken control of it, that I'd rather know that it's stupid than try to fake it and not say anything. And so it, it goes to this idea of creating agency and control over your own over your own feedback, but really reinforcing this idea that you want the reason you should try to always be true to your own thoughts and your own feelings is that makes you better over time. And the longer you go through your career and don't expose that and try to please people and just show them what you think that they're thinking, you actually don't get better. I mean, the best example of this is, is Megan. She is just amazing at this. No matter what, she always just spits out what the f she's thinking. And that has made her smarter and grow faster and learn. Your speed of learning simply increases. Um, can I skip a page or something? The uh, kind of covered this before, but a key learning here is redefining what is bad. So in our feedback system, in the way that we think about it, normally if, you, if you're in the second column here, you would be punished because you just got a bad score. You did some. You made a mistake. And me as your manager, and to punish you for making a mistake. But if you are punishing people for making mistakes, then by definition, they aren't going to learn, or it's going to be a very, very slow learning process. So one thing, and maybe amongst the most impactful things that we've done, is make not trying, i.e. hiding or being flat, so much worse than getting a bad score. I have so much respect and will put more energy into someone that's trying and failing and putting themselves out there and getting smacked than someone that's playing it safe and not trying. And that's, that's really, the, it's up to the leaders to do that. To be, if you're playing safe, if you're being political, if you're being a hider, that's not as good as someone that's, maybe they're, maybe they're technically worse than this person, but they're growing, they're learning, that that's the precursors of someone that's, that's gonna do better. So investing in those people. Kind of related to that, another key learning is that we make this all very public. So we're now doing this quarterly where we take this feedback rating. So everyone, myself included, uh, gets put into one of these four buckets. Is my feedback going up? Is it going down? Am I flat? Am I hiding? And we you get a couple of things. You get an email that shows you if you're a hider, you get this email in your box, and not good. Your manager gets an email, your guy's hiding, not good. This goes up in the bathroom, in the elevator, and everywhere else. You don't want to show up on this list. So we're making it culturally embarrassing to be hiding. I don't, I want people to win, so I want everyone trending up. At the end of the day, that's your know, performance is you're getting better. But it's just worse if you're, if you're hiding. And so we want to make it really uncomfortable to not get in the game. And the third problem set is how to own your feedback. It's probably the most important thing. I, I like this word kind of agency, which comes from the gaming world and the gamification world. When people feel like they own something, they own a process, they will engage in it at a much deeper level. If you feel it's been imposed on you, they'll reject it. Even if you can, and you can kind of engineer things where people, see, in reality, they're kind of only given limited choices, but the fact they're able to make a choice allows them to engage in the activity at a much deeper level, so feedback, feedback included. So I think one of the underlying principles, we talk about this a lot, you've probably already seen this slide like five times uh, already today, but this, this idea of what line are you standing on and make it easy for other people to tell you the truth. That most often, uh, I want to get a pat on the back. Uh, when I come home at the end of the day, and you know, my wife asks, you know, how do I look in this, you know, whatever she, she bought or something, or you know, not that I'm, I was going to say she made me dinner, but she hasn't made me dinner in like five years. <laughs> the, uh, you know, you want to hear something nice. So in that case, it's not appropriate for me to be dishing out the God's honest truth. But that's where just all our whole lives, everything in our whole lives is sort of biased towards staying in this line. And so the hard thing is that to realize me as an individual, it's not up to this person 
this fairy person that's going to show up and suddenly start telling me the truth in exactly the development area that I need to learn for me to get to become a better father, a better husband, a better leader. That person doesn't exist. If some truth teller shows up in your life, you should, you know, give them a bag of gold or something because that's so unusual and you're so lucky. But the person that will be that is you. You have to figure out how do I get over to that line. And the most important thing to do is to have and develop the skill of asking for feedback in an authentic way. Because it's very easy to ask for feedback in a way that's not so authentic. For example, for this presentation right now, I could say, uh, I worked on this all night. So much work to do. We're kind of running our business here. You know, so you know, I hope you like it. Right? That has a lot of you know hidden messages. In. I don't really want to know what you think. On the other hand, what this presentation represents is our latest learning on feedback. And me as an individual and us as a company, our mission is to improve workplace cultures and make adoption such that people love coming to work and actually get better every day by coming to work. And I'm going to give this presentation, which is true, another 10 times this year. And every piece of feedback you give me to make it better so that it actually resonates with you. If you tell me what doesn't work for you, that makes it a lot easier for me going forward. So please tell me that. That's a very different way of asking for feedback. And you have to get kind of learn, you have to learn that skill. You have It's hard. It's hard. Uh, kind of a related thought, this was from, um, we met a gentleman a, a few weeks ago actually, or Charlie and Megan, they're here, I met him a long time ago, but um, he started one of the more successful uh, charter school, or uh, yeah, charter schools here in, in New York City, so he took what was really a, one of the worst performing schools, um, it was a Harlem in the Bronx, but uh, and turned it around, made it to one of the best performing schools now as a whole, it's a whole series. Um, he used, and this was his language, that Integrity is when our espoused theories, what we believe, does not match the theories in use, what we do. And human nature means we all have a discrepancy in our integrity. And these gaps, they grow over time, what I call the entropy of integrity. Meaning, a lot of why people reject feedback or are scared of it or don't take control of it is that when someone tells you something like, you know, you said you're going to do this and you didn't, it feels like, oh, you're, you're really, you're attacking my integrity. Like, I believe this. Like, I, I, like, I'm a good person, so why are, why are you attacking me? I think part of one of the key insights is that if you start to think about integrity and eggshells as it just grows over time, it's just the nature of life. In the same way that barnacles grow in a ship, does anything grow in a plane? They, they need maintenance, you know, the bolts will fall off, whatever it is. But just the universe is full of entropy, everything, everything decays, including our integrity, because situations change. You may believe something and it kind of aligned your life to make that thing happen, but all of a sudden, you know, situations change, you're promoted to a new role. But when you start to think about the idea that eggshells are going to grow, there are going to be gaps that grow in my, in my intention and what's actually happening just naturally. So one thing that's kind of a hot topic here at Next Jump right now is our kind of development environment and how kind of kick-ass and cool and awesome it is to develop code here. So that matters. If you're a coding engineer, that matters. Like the system you have. The, the way that we manage code, the way that we integrate that into the system, the way that we release it. And my intention is that that is awesome and flawless, but the reality is we haven't really upgraded that in a couple of years. So now it's, does that mean like I'm a bad person in that? But that is a gap in, in integrity, meaning I'm saying that that matters to me, but I haven't invested in three years. So what am I going to do with that? So that's I'm saying that. I don't know if Albert's here, but this has been a, been an argument where I'm like, what are you talking about? But then. Eventually it sinks in, you know what, I think you're kind of right. There's a, a gap is growing here. But it's just, it's powerful when you think of and take ownership of the own, of the gaps that exist, especially in our work life, but really all over our lives, between our intentions <coughs> and, and what reality is. It touches everything. It's, you know, I, my intention is to be an amazing father. My intention is to be an amazing husband. My intention is to be an amazing leader. But the reality is, unless I find those gaps, uh, you can't actually address them. You have to be open to, open to those gaps. Um, another learning that's kind of key in this is the frequency with which someone gets feedback is, I think, very indicative of their openness to growth, their openness to, to uh, kind of owning their own feedback. So these two charts represent it's kind of a heat map of feedback to, from two groups. So one group here is a high performing group, the other group was on the lower end of, of performance. And this represents uh, 
<coughs> period of time, uh, five week period, and you're seeing that basically if there's color on that dot, that means that those people got feedback on that day. So you're seeing the leaders of the performing teams are getting feedback almost every single week. The leaders of the teams that are not performing are hardly, get, are hardly getting any feedback. Basically, there's just one dot, and that was a forced event. So this kind of goes to the notion when you're a high-performing team and a high-performing leader, you're actually out seeking feedback. Like, I'm not scheduling these things. Like, they're actually going out and doing it themselves. They're, they're creating their environment to get feedback more often to find those gaps between what they want to have happen and what's happening and actually close them. So probably the key lesson here is like high, per high performers seek feedback more frequently. It's, it's consistency of feedback matters much more than intensity. Like the 10x thing you saw earlier was like an intense event. Like you can't do that every single week. However, that type of event, people that kind of perform very well and they kind of they seem relaxed and like they know themselves well and they're developing, that happens because they've been chipping away at it consistently for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. Uh, you know, feedback that is all of a sudden floodlight out of the blue, you know, once in a blue moon, once a year, it doesn't have the same change effect on people as consistent feedback. Another thing that happens with consistent feedback is almost always what we found is that people find value in the patterns that they're seeing in feedback. It's very rare that someone's going to give you a piece of feedback and like, wow, my mind is blown. I never knew that about myself and now I'm completely changed. It's that you see the patterns. Uh, so this is a printout. So this is a meeting sometime last year. This is about me. If you read it, it's terrible. This is awful feedback. <laughs> you don't want to read this by yourself. I seem very afraid. I was making a point just for the sake of it. It's trying not to look good. I don't recall an insightful comment. I didn't say much. My points were confusing. You seem scared not something you want to read about yourself. And when I got this, I was pissed. You know, I lived three miles away. I walked home. And I'm like, so infuriated, so embarrassed. So like, you know, 100 emotions going through. And this was a meeting with our, our, our key leadership, our MB21. So it's 21 people. This is from 20, from 20 people. The reality is, if my boss, like Charlie Megan, said this to me, I'd probably still be pissed. But I would like kind of like, maybe I'd believe it, maybe I wouldn't. They're kind of biased. They don't understand. You know, kind of have your whatever mental block you have with your own boss. But when you're seeing it across 20 people giving you feedback, and you're seeing basically a consistent thing, it took me a while to work this out with my TP Greg. But like when I came into this meeting, the truth was I didn't want to be there. I was kind of upset about something else. Um, I was just not engaged in this meeting. And I knew I had to kind of, I'd be dinged if I didn't say something, so I was just kind of saying stuff, blah, blah, blah. But it would have been so much more honest and so much more powerful if I just walked in there and said, you know, whatever, guys. Like, the reality is this other stuff's on my mind. I'm pissed off being here. We should have this meeting. That's the truth. That's where I'm at right now. I would have got dinged for throwing that, you know, probably uh, emotion grenade down, down the table. But at least that would have been the truth, and I would have, like, held my head high. But this is what um, that type of insight doesn't come out if you're getting one piece of feedback. It does come out when you're seeing feedback over time. So in this case, it was kind of an intense event, so it got a lot at once. But when you're seeing and able to look at feedback over a long period of time, and that's where you, that's where you start to see really value in this sense. I think another important pattern is that we found that feedback from an anonymous feedback, but from a known group, is the most important, or the most useful. So in this venue, for example, we don't really know each other. Uh, and Or even in our, our all-company meeting, uh, you know, this, 200 people there, the, the feedback tends to be very, very variable. You'll get people that are like, you're amazing, you did this, you have people you suck, you did this, and you'll kind of read the comments. Some of it is really insightful, some of it's crap, um, but it's, you have to really think about it and use your judgment about that feedback, because the people in a large group, people know you and they don't know you, they'll know the situation, they won't know the situation. So it's, it's more difficult to make heads or tails of it. But if you do it in a known group, so typically what, you know, this is our group of, you know, 20 or so leaders, I think they have the 21 the group is now only 14 right now, but sort of a 5 to 20-ish number, and you start to get feedback that's much more consistent and much more useful, because the people know you, they know the situation, they're seeing you over, over a longer period of time. So I say this from a very personal level, and it's you know, anecdotally validated by um, other next jumpers in, in, in other podcasts. 
partners that when you start getting kind of this anonymous feedback from a known group, it tends to be much more useful. The patterns are more apparent and the, is the quality of the, the feedback is more useful. <clears throat> Another important learning, something that we took from the Navy, uh, but it's probably a kind of a military-wide thing, but this concept of a debrief. The idea that after, so they call it PBEDS, uh, plan, brief, execute, debrief. So in particular, this debrief process. So this happens in our kind of coding world, we have something called sprints. So every two weeks, basically, we have a cycle of we're coding something. You, you, the beginning, you declare what you're going to code, and then you spend the next two weeks doing that, and do it again okay, every two weeks. At the end of that cycle, we have what we call a debrief, where someone stands up in front of, in front of the group, so it's a known group, and says, this is what I said I was going to do. I was going to add this new feature. I was going to you know, sell this client. I was going to do whatever. Then this is what actually happened. So maybe that happened. Maybe something better happened. Maybe nothing happened. And then most importantly, you self-rate yourself. I gave myself a one to four. And then everyone goes around the room and kind of comments on what you did, what you could have done better. Then we use the feedback app at the end. But most importantly, we're not rating people on how well you did or, or technical skills about how you, you know, could do better. We're rating each other in self-awareness. Did you rate yourself accurately? Because as a learning organization, or as someone that learn to be a self-learner, you need to be able to accurately rate yourself and let other people know that you're you know, where you stand. Otherwise, you're not going to get help. Meaning, if you're putting out false bravado that you know you know you kind of did like crap, but you're acting like you did awesome, no one's going to kind of help you. The same way, if you're too meek and you kind of did you know pretty good, but you're too you know too uh, you know humble to admit it, you're also not going to get the right kind of feedback. So we really, really want people to self-assess correctly and to give people that feedback on, are you actually able to be honest with your team about how you did? And it's interesting, we've seen a lot of you know, personal growth from this, because especially younger people, it's actually hard. It's a little bit of a learned skill to self-assess correctly. I think because, really, school teaches you to lie, in a way. If you give a presentation in school, you're just trying to like put the best front on whatever it is. You're trying to get the A. Uh, and most of corporate America is kind of set up that way, too. You're just trying to like get the A all the time as opposed to going into a team that's designed to help you and saying, you know, actually I didn't do well, and these are the reasons why I think I didn't do well. Because when you do that authentically, people will help you. They'll actually say, yeah, sort of, but actually I think if you try this other angle, that would actually help you better. And that's the kind of team learning dynamic that we want to encourage. Uh, another important point, kind of the last, uh, the last learning in this series, is the importance of recovery programs. So th this is another printout. This isn't me, this is Greg Kunkel. I don't remember what meeting this was, but similarly, he got terrible feedback. Greg can, uh, you know, squirm looking at this, but the um, it's the same kind of thing where um, a lot of you know it was, a, it was a bad meeting, it was a bad it was a bad event. The reality is that feedback is most often poorly delivered, badly phrased, maybe unfair. It's all these sort of negative things associated with it. Uh, so we work on and are still working on. How do you get? How do you, as an individual, recover from that? And people have different sort of recovery periods. If you're more kind of confident and to the point of arrogance, you know, maybe if you're President Trump and you get some negative thing, like boom, you know, you probably recover pretty quick. You know, high, high confidence. If you're me, less confidence. You know, you get some bad feedback. You know, I'm just kind of stewing on it for a few days. So, how do you actually make that happen sooner? How do you turn it into a more constructive process? Uh, this is our kind of process now, which is, number one, you talk about it with a trusted person. So in our organization, it's our talking partner. And your talking partner is really you're each other's coach. So after that meeting I was talking about a few minutes ago, where I did so terribly, you know, that's me and Greg saying, like, I just, oh, I feel like shit because of that. That was unfair. And, uh, so talk it out. Then sleep on it. So when you're so emotional, you can't really make heads or tails of this kind of thing. Number three, then print it out. So we actually print it out. and. Start using your own judgment, because even in this, there are things that make no sense. Just strike it out. Like, I don't, for whatever reason, if you're being honest with yourself, some of it you just don't agree with, wipe it out, delete it, get it out of there. And then highlight the parts that are the pattern. And by doing that, that's when you start to see these things emerge where, okay, even if it's unfair, unfairly said, even if it's maybe the context is kind of not right. And, me, and really, I think this is, the, the higher you are up in kind of a leadership point of view, the more irksome this kind of getting this feedback is, because the people below you don't really know what it's like to be you. They don't know the other pressures that you're in. 
you know, they're not aware of the full situation. However, there is still some gold in that. And it's up to me as the recipient of that. It's up to me as my own coach. It's up to me as someone that gives a shit if I grow and learn to find the gold in that and develop from it. So th these are those kind of 10 uh, you know, very specific lessons that, that we've learned. These are embedded within our feedback system. I think why we put this together is that even if you aren't doing 10x, even if you aren't using the app per se, there are, I think these elements are important to set up and are important to integrate into a, into a feedback system. And really solving or, or addressing these three issues that it is difficult to give feedback, it's difficult and painful to look bad in front of peers, and most importantly, how do you get people to really own their feedback and take control of it versus feel like it was something that you know, is imposed on them. I think another thing, just to, as a preview, uh, if anyone's interested, we're, we'll, please speak to me. We'll set aside a little time on Friday. Uh, but one thing Greg and I have developed is what we call a feedback workshop. So it's something we're doing with companies to actually help them integrate feedback into their organization. And it's a lot of the same content, but maybe structured a little differently around, number one, how do you set up, the how do you set up your organization to integrate feedback? So communicating the intent to your common colleagues and employees specific programs, and really avoiding the biggest mistake, which is not creating safety. Like people, at the end of the day, people do not feel safe. If they feel they will get demoted by giving critical feedback, or it's set up in a way that will get them demoted, like, it's not gonna work. <laughs> so how do you address that? How to receive feedback. So how do you authentically ask for it? How do you own your own feedback? And it be empowering for you versus an imposed thing. How do you recover? And avoiding the mistake of, the biggest mistake is not having people own their own feedback. Once again, if it comes across as just, this is just another mechanism for my boss to kind of give me stuff, or you know, give me feedback in some back channel, it doesn't work. If people feel like the feedback is being, impl this feedback is making me better at something I want to be better at, then it becomes empowering, and you end up with those two heat maps I showed, the, the people that are getting lots of feedback and asking for it on their own, those are people that are out there trying to get better at something they care about. Unless you get in that zone, it's hard for it to, to impact, impact you. And the third topic is how to give feedback. You know, fast and visceral, frequent. The, the biggest mistake is letting people, or trying to have people write the perfect, the perfect piece of feedback. I think one mistake we found is that this is a huge topic in the corporate world of implementing these kind of pulse feedback systems or real-time feedback, is that a lot of the implementation is focused on how to give feedback. Because in our experience, we found that's a little bit of a mistake. It, People do need to get practice at that for, sh for sure. However, the reality is people are just never going to give you, it's so hard to do, you're unlikely to train someone to be like this perfect feedback giver. So it's more the greater ROI in really putting energy into you know, the correct setup of the organization as well as training um, and helping people deal with feedback and, 